Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast so it sounds great. They'll even distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. All right. All right, guys. Welcome back to another episode of It Is What It Is podcast. I'm your host, Cody Kelly. Connect with me on IGS CVMK33. I got some great news. My app is coming out. Website is already out, about to launch. It's going to be just an amazing summer, an amazing fall. I want to introduce my guests uh, for today. I have the illustrious three. I call them, these are three voices. <laughs> I've got a lead in the Church of God in Christ. I'll start with the most senior ranking one is Pastor Warren Doris. From Juliet, Illinois, pastor of Prayer Tower. He is the senior pastor. He's the one with the blank screen because he has been working all day. I appreciate his leadership and his commitment to this podcast. I have also with me Pastor Spencer. He is the pastor of a Freedom Dominion Church senior pastor. He is a rising star in the Church of God in Christ. Look for him to become general board member within the next 20 years. <laughs> and I have with me one of the real strong community leaders within Joliet, Reverend Kevin Doris. He's a senior elder of Holy Temple Church of God in Christ. It is an honor to have you gentlemen on the show thank today. You. How are you guys doing? Well, great. thank doing you. Tremendous. Thank yeah. you for having us. Good. Thank you for the great introduction. I'm just Brother Kevin. <laughs> Oh, anytime, anytime. Feel free to cash at me after this. Anytime. Hey, I'm going to get it down into it. <laughs> I'm going to get down into it. Look, look, we got a lot to cover. We got a short span. Uh, I want to get your thoughts uh, really on the status of the Church of God in Christ and really its role with civil rights. I'm going to start here and then we'll kind of uh, take a hard shift. Uh, starting with you, Pastor Warren Doris. Uh, initial thoughts on the killing of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery <coughs> and the like. Well, you know, I think that uh, it has been happening all the time, but I think that uh, George Floyd's murder on uh, television, when you look at that, is just uh, horrible. I think it has uh, waken up a lot of people in America to look at all the other previous murders. A young man walking, jogging down the street, the young lady killed in her own home. It was one of the worst things I've ever seen in America, and I think it's going to bring change to America. Pastor Spencer? Uh, I concur with what uh, Pastor Dora said. It has been happening all the time. Um, when I heard about it, I was very, I was upset, enraged, um, wanted to burn down something. But I have, thank God, I have the Holy Ghost. He burns in me. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's been, it's something that's been happening, and it's just, it's just sad that it takes something of this magnitude to get us on one accord, if you would, um, to really fight for change, see the change, be the change, and affect change. Reverend Doris? Hey, man, well, you know, like you said, like the two said before me, it's been happening all the time. Uh, we may come from different backgrounds, but we all feel the same. Uh, I have been involved in civil rights in my past, and I had come outside of the church and I used to be a rebel. So I understood. I come up in a time in the 80s when they had the riots in L.A. I wasn't even saved there. But then I knew Rodney King had gotten beaten. And I knew the tragedy that happened then was going to happen again because the mindset of the oppressor, the police, hadn't changed. Generations have changed. But, you know, the mindset hadn't changed. And until the mindset changes, this thing that we're going through right now is not going to change. It has to start within before it works outward. So it's got to start within the ranks of the police departments, and then it has to work out toward the community. They're supposed to be officer friendly, right? All right. I don't think nobody right now feels that they're very friendly. I, w I want to take this hard pivot, um, son of this grand old church, well, grandson of this grand old church. Uh, <laughs> love it. Uh, but I think when you're speaking truth to power, you have to be fully transparent. Uh, had a conversation uh, a couple years ago uh, with my grandfather, discuss basically discussing what kind of transpired between the Emmett Till funeral, Dr. King coming to Chicago in 1966. He shared with me, he said, leadership within our church was told not to get involved. They didn't mind supporting him financially uh, and being the spiritual anchor uh, for the movement, but actually protesting 
actually putting themselves on the line was never the official stance of the Church of God in Christ. And he said it was wrong. And looking back, he wished he would have changed and really kind of would have went against leadership at that time. And I want to start there because it's, it is what it is, right? Uh, it's not about being perfect, but it is about understanding going forward. <laughs> what is the stance? Uh, what is our civic and civil rights duty um, from the Church of God in Christ? And Reverend Spencer, I'll start with you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think with the with the with the responsibility of the church, and with what the church has, um, from my understanding. Um, for the most part, the church has been involved, uh, not necessarily on a large scale where we had maybe a social justice um, committee commission, but throughout the annals of time, we have been in, we have been uh, involved. Uh, we have voiced our concern uh, not only for America, but for how America treated our people. Um, some in in some aspects, uh, even when it comes to as you were discussing Emmett Till and 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 Dr. King coming to Chicago, uh, some some aspects I think uh, we we have become, and it's not just in the in the Church of God in Christ world, but in the Black Church. Period across the board, we become crabs in a barrel every time one person tries to go up. We're pulling them down. Uh, once we get one set focus, and I believe we have that set focus at this time, that we get one set focus and we go after the focus, it makes no difference who's talking. It makes no difference who's at the forefront. All the diff all that matters is that change happens. And I feel as though that the Church of God in Christ has always been there, always fighting. I'll even go back as far to I remember a story about Bishop Mason. Um, Bishop Mason um, did not was not totally against the war, the World War II. Uh, his 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 indictment to the war, uh, from the story that I understand, was not that the, that our men went that our brothers and sisters went and fought. the The issue his issue was they went and fought, and then they couldn't even wear their uniforms at all. Hmm. So I think it, it's kind of. Uh, a two-edged sword, if you would. Yeah. Um, that that we're dealing with because you want me to fight for a country that in their constitution says that I'm three fifths of a person. Right, right. Reverend Doris, uh, uh Reverend Kevin Doris, uh, one set focus. What is that one set focus uh for the church of God in Christ now? Who is that folk person or body that is leading the way? generation who are out on the forefront right now is going to lead the charge to where the church goes. And the reason I say that is because the vitality, the energy, and the stamina is with the young people. Every time we had a revolution, it's always been led by the younger generation. Uh, when you have a younger generation that's on fire and for righteousness and justice, they're going to be the ones that take the brunt, they're the ones that's going to take the lead and that's going to take the charge. And we have to allow them to do that if we're going to maintain our identity in the 21st and 22nd century. Pastor Edwards, uh, your, your, I want to get your thoughts. What is the set focus? Uh, uh, Reverend Kevin, he mentioned it, the younger generation. Uh, Pastor Spencer mentioned it, uh, you know, kind of focusing on, you know, the ability to serve and not serve and the equal treatment at home. Uh, but if you're a leader in this church, uh, you have seen the church evolve. What is that focus? Well, I, I think the focus is that every American is treated fairly. Let me say this. Uh, we we, we uh, have submitted to the leadership of Church of God in Christ. We have a leader, Bishop Charles Harrison Blake, that has set down some uh, information, as has taken position papers that is against everything that has happened. Now, I think we have to recognize that he is our chief apostle, but when we get into our local communities, then we need to follow through with some of the same concepts because we don't want to say that our national church is saying one thing and we're doing something else. The problem is we cannot depend on a letter and position paper from our bishop to change things here in Illinois. We have to be change agents. We have to be change agents in our church. Uh, I've been fighting a battle here in, uh, in Joliet for the last 
five days, where the mayor, who's a white man, abused an African American man last Sunday. We're calling for his, uh, uh, for him to resign. Now that's not popular with some people, but you, you've got to be man enough to stand up and say this is wrong, uh, and and that's what we're doing. Another thing too, I think, have to recognize. You know, one thing that Bishop Marshall stated back when uh, Martin Luther King came to Chicago, Martin Luther King said Marquette Park was one of the worst racist places. He felt more racist than ever before. Clay Evans went to see uh, uh, Martin Luther King and the banks held up his loan. He was building Fellowship Church. He had to steal in the air for nine years and no one in Chicago would give him a loan because he went to meet Dr. Martin Luther King. So a lot of times the church takes statements, uh, take positions like that because they recognize the long range ramifications could just be horrible. And it took Clay Evans seven or eight years that that uh, still stood in there and no one gave him a loan to finish his church because he marched with Dr. King. Follow up question. What is the church's duty toward civil rights? Um, is it, is it, I, I'm hearing this, this battle between justice and salvation as if both don't go hand in hand. When, when you're talking to your congregation, and obviously this is the climate of today and tomorrow, and you get nudging from well, what about like the Holy Ghost? What is your answer? Pastor Doris, your answer. Let me tell you something. I, I'm known as a militant pastor. I'm known as not being uh, sometimes, uh, I believe, and, and yesterday I was preaching, and I preached yesterday uh, about uh, are we really sure where we're going? And I talked about what happened. I talked about all the people who were murdered. I talked about the people that had been treated fairly. I talked about people who were lynched in the past. And then I came back to our base. Our base is, is that nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord stands assured. And having this seal, the Lord knoweth for there than his. I talk a lot about local issues in my church every Sunday. But I always go back to the cross that, that the Holy Ghost power would lead and guide us in all things. I believe that pastors are making a huge mistake if they don't stand up for social justice. Whether you're Baptist Church or God in Christ, a -E 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 or want to be me. Uh, it is time to <laughs> stand up in their pulpit and call injustice as injustice, call it out loud, and then give the people hope that we have the blessed hope that we can do better. We've got to call it out. Definitely, definitely. Pastor Spencer, we've seen the church kind of shift. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, it was name it, claim it, praise, and you shall receive it. Uh, how do you draw the bridge between prophecy and civic responsibility? Um, the bridge between prophecy and civic responsibility for me is literally preaching the gospel. The gospel is a gospel of social justice. The gospel is a gospel of salvation. It's a gospel of, of prophecy. If, if you, if we stick to the text, a lot of times, a lot of times we're not, we're, we're preaching what people want to hear and not to the text because Malachi said, that's Malachi 6 and 8 that says, let justice flow. No, no, that's not Malachi. The Malachi 6 and 8 says to do justly and love mercy. All right. Um, that, 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 that is social justice. Mm -hmm. If we preach the Bible, then, then we will preach. You have context, context on everything that happens in the world. The problem is we take four or five scriptures and those four or five scriptures are the scriptures for this for this quarter. Everybody going to preach. Most preachers you hear going to preach from from uh, Act 16, Paul and Silas at, down at midnight. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. If you preach the full range of the gospel, the full range of the 66 books, you lie in social justice. You cannot preach the gospel and not preach social justice because Jesus even preached social justice. What, what's the pressure? What's stopping the, the leaders of the clergy from the full extent of the gospel? The full extent of the gospel, I believe, and again, this is my belief, um, is that some, some are scared. Some are scared um, to preach the full extent of the gospel for either for either um, their own for their own personal reasons. They're scared to preach the full extent of the gospel. Uh, some just don't. They 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 stay in their lane. They feel like I'm a prosperity teacher or or I'm a deliverance 
I'm a deliverance preacher or what have you. And they try to stay in a lane, but you really can't stay in a if you if your prosperity, then you can't really prosper unless you change what's what's happening in society. If you're deliverance, you can't deliver me until you teach me how to be delivered from the mindset that they put me in 400 years ago. So you you're they're scared, they try to stay in their veins and stay where they want to go, stay where they feel like they're called, and they don't go into the into the deep annals of the text and really and really bring the text up and let the text preach to the times. You don't preach at the times, you preach to the times. And that's how you become a voice for the time. And a lot of times we don't we don't we don't get in that in that pendulum and I'll be and I'll be uh, the one to say it. And if I'm in trouble, I've been in trouble before. Um, not only is it what they like, but it's also they like they want to make sure that they don't miss the offering that comes. Hmm. Re- Reverend Kevin, I'm going to pass this one to you. Um, wow. Finances and race go hand in hand. Economic <laughs> security. Looking at the culture church, looking predominantly at the black church, why? Why is there such um, uh, un- unevenness and a disparity between the evangelicals? And then is there economic pressure to perform, even if that means you don't talk about uh, justice and, and civic uh, duty and civil rights? Well, like uh, Pastor Spencer said, they preach a certain thing because they believe that's their specialty. Um, <clears throat> the Bible tells me in 2 Corinthians 5.18 that all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We have an opportunity and a duty to preach what's right. And by doing that, we have to give the whole auspice of the gospel a chance to be delivered to the people. Uh, as far as the church, we talk about black churches. You talk about black churches. All black churches aren't the same. Black nationalism churches are not the same as Pentecostal churches in most cases. You have to understand you have Pentecostal churches where like the Church of God in Christ. Then you have black national churches, which always taught um, about black history and black secularism and things of that nature. So depending on what they're trying to uh, put forth as their agenda is what's per, uh, persuaded by the people. We got to understand, as far as finances, the black church, and I learned this a long time ago, we are the only ones that can be sharecroppers or plumbers or carpenters by day and be preachers and clergymen at night, where the evangelical churches, they have full staffs, and that's their full-time jobs. And so we would always do double work in the black church a lot of times. And so we're just set up that way. For some reason, we we depending a lot of times people are depending on finances of the parishioners to make uh, their church work. And so you got people who are on staff. You got people who are uh, getting salaries. You got people who need that uh, from the parishioners to make their churches work. But, you know, if you just do what the Bible says, uh, Malachi 3, and then you should bring your tithes to the storehouse. And that, so if you do that and you do what you're supposed to do, everything should take care of itself. Pastor Dora, speaking about ties offering with COVID-19, uh, dealing with this economic disruption globally, right? Is the message or should the message be still give? Uh, if you have uh, 40 million Americans that have been, uh, or at least have filed for unemployment that have been negatively impacted from this, uh, what is the church's responsibility toward the community on an economic level? And do we do a good job in addressing the need? Well, I think, you know, the needs have changed. But let me tell you, most churches and pastors I've talked to, and, and especially mine, our tithing has increased probably 20% since March 15 when we shut the church down. It's phenomenal. And other churches have done that. Now, let me tell you what we've done in response. We start giving more away. Uh, we've been uh, our, there was a problem with our shelter here in town, our daybreak shelter. So they moved uh, people in the various hotels. We adopted a hotel and we've been feeding the people who needed help. People have been coming for money and we've been giving it to them. We have a week care ministry that's headed up by my wife. They're having a conference call here in a, a little bit. We've probably given more money away so far this year than we did all last year. I believe that people have to make up their mind if they're going to trust God. If you have substance coming in 
Amen. And, and you give to the Lord. The Lord's word will not return void. He said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings that you can't receive. I think a lot of times what happens when we get in a, in a, in a tight situation, we try to make excuses why we can't do what the Lord told us to do. But the Lord, first of all, doesn't need our money. He wants us to trust him enough to know that I will give it to you. And, uh, or, you know, if, if you're making $100,000 a year and you have no no issues, it's probably easy for you to give $10,000. $10, but if you got a person only only making ten. That thousand is a lot more. But what I found out, because when I was uh, young and in college, I still tithed. And when I tithed, God blessed us. And now that we, uh, I'm retired, my wife and I are both retired, you know, 10% is just the beginning. We probably get 30%. Why? Because we know the more we give, the more the Lord's going to give to us. Perfect, perfect. Pastor Spencer, I'll pass that question to you. Uh, tithing, um, definitely believe in it. But I understand apprehension. I understand this, you know, the struggle to tithe, not just from a faith uh, standpoint, but asking for something that might not be there uh, is hard. It's miraculous. Right. So if you with the economic report and even though supposedly we gained three million jobs, which I think is a lot of baloney and your congregation has been impacted. Is there apprehension to ask for giving or is it just business as usual? Like, how do you approach tithing? Uh, as Pastor Dora said, it's, it's definitely about the mindset of the people. Uh, I don't necessarily, uh, uh, feel like it is un, uh, not right. If you would not to ask, I still ask the Bible says you have not cause you ask now. Um, so I ask, but I also make, I all, we also have to be clear on it. Um, I think a lot of times we get caught up in the emotionalism of giving um, and we don't do use the principles of giving. So I definitely make sure that that the principles of giving are understood. You tithe because you're in covenant with God. You sow a seed or you release a seed uh, into the ground because you expect a harvest, um, not necessarily to 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 take you from or take anything from you. And I one thing I always like to tell the tell the people the, the people where I serve is that your tithe, you should already have your tithe in your budget. So you know you're getting paid on Friday. Take your 10% out. So we ask, but we don't we we don't ask amiss. We ask, but we also in this season understand that. Uh, if something comes up or if it's been a person that is a faithful giver, if you please, and because they're unable to work or one once one week they've been able unable to give, it's nothing of, of, of a dire strait because even in your giving as the church of God, we're also it is also our duty to look after the widow, look after the, the orphan and the stranger. So as, as it's coming in, we're also looking out saying, listen, how can we assist you? Is there something we can do that can touch you to help you along the way? So I don't believe it. I, I believe it is business as usual, but I only say it's business as usual because we should all we should have always been doing the business of the church. And that's to tend his sheep and take care of his lambs. Reverend Doris, uh, Reverend Kevin, I want to. Uh hit you with this one, tending the sheep. Uh, what does that look like? Um, looking at the complexity of the world, right? What does tending the sheep now look like? Well, you have to look at how people have come into believing the faith of God through Jesus Christ as this COVID-19 virus has hit. I have had more people ask me for prayer. I've had more people ask me uh, to get closer to God. Now, I don't know if they're going to run to the churches when the church is open, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not uh, trying to have a relationship with God. Our duty should be trying to bring people to Christ. We can't save them, but Jesus saves them through us. And we have to be living epistles, be uh, vessels that allow people to come to Christ. And so that's we all have a responsibility to evangelize. We all have loved ones in our family that need to be saved. We have uh, neighbors that need to be saved. We have people that we grew up with that need to be saved. So they may not be arch in our church, but the body of Christ 
is bigger than just our church four walls. And in the Bible, it says that other sheep do I have, neither this flock. So you got to understand, they may not join your church. It says one man plans to see another waters, right? And so our job is just to do our part in the body of Christ and watch the kingdom grow. All right, gentlemen, last hard question before I, you know, we do our little signature sign off. I'm going to throw this one. Brace yourself. This is a curveball. I totally believe, and Reverend Kevin, I'll start with you. I totally believe uh, in equality. Um, I believe in female pastoralship. I believe in female apostleship. Our denomination has been slack, I think is the best way to say it, in the advancements of our sisters. However, if you look at who's doing the majority of the work, it's them. So, Reverend Doris, what do you say? What does the future look like? Like, if you can be a state supervisor, can't you be an elder? That's a non-gender specific role, biblically speaking. Hmm. Well, a lot of these titles are going to go to heaven. You have to understand that Jesus came to serve, and we have to be servants. A lot of times we got titles in the churches given to us because we did some work, we, we've been good, we did this and we passed the test or whatever, but God doesn't know gender when it comes to souls. So what he's going to do, he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. That's what it tells me in the Bible, am I right? Right. And when we look at that, and I don't know how long it's going to be before the Church of God in Christ changes their stance, but, you know, I recognize the spirit of God in a person, not just on paper. I've had people pray for me who was female, and because they prayed for me, I got through. I was able to do something different. So I know this is a loaded question. I see the smiles on the other guys' faces, and I'm gonna let them take it. I'm gonna pour for the time because I can see that. You know, hey, this is a loaded question, not and you trying to get somebody in trouble on this one. I'm not. I'm just trying to pick. I'm just trying to pick your brain. Pass the doors. I'm gonna pass out to you. You know, I believe you know me. Thank you. I, I, <laughs> hey, you see, I came online for that one. Uh, let, let me tell you, and, and your grandfather, mm -hmm. I went to him. I had uh, four women that were tremendous workers in our church, lovers of the gospel, preachers of the gospel. And they wanted to marry. They wanted to do things that elders do. And, of course, the Church of God in Christ uh, does not allow that. Uh, and now we say we don't allow that, but we know in some jurisdictions right here in Illinois, we have women pastors who are also supervisors. We mm -hmm. have women pastors that the bishops have said they're pastors, and that's it. So what I did, I went to Bishop Marshall. I said, Bishop, I'm going to ordain four women. I'm going to ordain them through the state of Illinois. I will not violate the Church of God in Christ. I will not allow, let them to do the ordinance of the Church of God in Christ. I went to the state's attorney, took him our constitution. He looked at our constitution, came back, and said to me, wouldn't you rather have these holy women marrying people on Saturday morning than a drunk judge who comes in to do it? Wouldn't you rather have these holy women serving people? And I said, yes. So what I did, uh, uh, we, we got them ordained through the state of Illinois. They cannot do the ordinance of the Church of God in Christ because then I would violate what I've said. I would uphold the Constitution. They are tremendous preachers. They do a wonderful job in the church. They are ordained elders. And finally, the state's attorney looked at our credentials and said their credentials are more powerful than the ones I pay $750 a year to get. And so I have elders in my church. It was, I took a lot of heat. You probably heard of some elders in my jurisdiction called the bishop on me. Of course, he already knew uh, when I went to the convocation of the year because I put the ceremony. We had a tremendous ceremony on Facebook. Uh, there were people who had questions. Well, let me tell you what's happened. I have friends of mine now all over the country who have done the same thing that I've done. They've gone to their state's attorney and they've ordained women. The Bible says that uh, he's going to pour out his spirit only on the men. That's not what it says. It says on all flush. Uh, Paul said in Christ said that, that the, the, the anointing does not know gender. And that's the thing we got to do. If you're qualified and put yourself in place, God will anoint you. The anointing does not know gender. And last thing I'm going to say, the men have messed up so bad. Why don't we get the women a chance? I can do a whole segment on men messing up, but I don't want to get kicked out this grand old church. And I don't want no smoke from anybody. So not that I don't mind, but, you know, you know, Papa not here no more. So I can't. I can't just throw off like that, but Reverend Spencer, you're the young rising star. The church is in your hand next 30 years. Are we going to get to the point where our sisters in Christ 
cannot just attend the convocation, not just become a state supervisor, but can do everything that these men can. For the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach. Um, I'm, I'm with Elder Kevin Doris on this. Um, and I might take some flack. Some people watching might might not agree with me. Um, but as 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 long as as long as it stands as it is in the church, I go with the church. Um, and I say that like this because in, in a lot of aspects, I grew up. I grew up. Um, Mama was a district missionary when I when I grew up. She is now the state supervisor. OK, one thing I've learned and I'll say it like this. I grew up with women pastors in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm not again. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not against it at all uh, against them leaving um, their respective congregations. They were effective. We had some of the greatest uh, lady pastors in, the, in, in I feel in the in the brotherhood. Uh, Mother Irene Oakley. We had Pastor Maria Gardner Langston, who's now in uh, in California. We had we had a little lady by the name uh, Mother Pastor Gladys Grimble in our area, who carried on a wonderful church. Um, in twenty thirty years, I don't I don't know how the the, the dynamics of the church will change. Um, but I'll say it like this. Um, and I said this to people, and uh, some might not agree with me, but if I was a woman in the church, I wouldn't fight so hard because these ladies have churches, they have appreciation, <laughs> they do everything we that that the man do on the on the on the on the counter side, and a lot of them even and we be honest, a lot of them marry and 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 baptize and everything they do in their local church, they do it all. Um, but when it comes to their report, they ain't paying seven hundred fifty dollars like Pastor Thor. They got they paying a good old one fifty for an evangelist missionary. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll weigh the two. But I think uh, as as the church progresses, uh, things will progress. And and when we come into that area, for me, I look at the church holistically. Uh, so that means there will be a lot of shit if if that does happen in the church. It's a lot of shifting that's going to come with current as the church stands currently with supervisors, district missionaries. That's a lot of shifting, and that and, and, and that 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 bag is going to shift real hard. So it it all depends on you know how they want that bag to to empty out. All right, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Uh, I just appreciate your commitment to this. Uh, maybe we just need to change the reports and we'll all be equal. And I'll end on that one. Pastor Doris, where can <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? What are you doing right now? Where can people connect with you? I can't hear you, Pastor Doris. Oh, no, you're muted. Say that again. Say that again, Pastor Doris. You have yourself muted. You're muted, sir. Let's see. You're muted, Pastor Doris. Where can people connect with you? Here it is. You're on now. Uh, 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 Prayer Tower Ministries, Joel, Illinois. Uh, PTC, Prayer Tower Ministries at SBC Globe. And we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Just look us up. You'll find us. All right. Reverend Kevin, where can people connect with you? Where can they find you? Well, I have a page on Facebook, uh, Kevin L. Doris. I have a Sunday School Think Tank page on Facebook where we go over to Sunday School Lessons weekly, globally. And I'm also on Instagram as uh, Rev Dapper Jet. And you can reach me at KLDoris1964 at gmail.com. And I am an associate elder at Holy Temple Church of God in Christ in Joliet, Illinois. All right, Pastor Spencer, where can they follow you? Where can they connect with you? You can just look me up on Facebook, on Instagram, Twitter, R. Matthew Spencer. I'm there. You can connect with us. 
Uh, on Facebook, you can also uh, like the fan page, Pastor R. Matthew Spencer, and you can connect there and we'll bring you all in together because we're all better together. All right. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate it. Until next time, guys. Thanks. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.